Welcome to our four-part series on 12 lead EKG acquisition and interpretation. This is part one and we'll review anatomy, physiology, and pathophysiology of the heart. You are called to the residence of a 50-year-old male who began experiencing chest pain earlier in the day. En route to the call, you begin to consider some differential diagnoses that may be the root cause of a person's chest pain. Can you think of five now? How about an MI, STEMI, pneumonia, recent trauma, acid reflux, pneumothorax, or an aortic aneurysm? You arrive on scene and you obtain the subjective data. You have a 50-year-old male who developed chest pain today at 9 o'clock while mowing his lawn with a push mower. The patient described the pain as retrosternal, sharp, 10 out of 10, and had accompanying nausea and dizziness. No change with deep inspiration, and the pain is not reproducible. The patient has a past medical history including hypertension and hypercholesterolemia. He takes lisinopril 20 milligrams once a day and simvastatin 20 milligrams once a day. He has no allergies to food, medicine, or latex. He had a right hip replacement in 2008. The patient smokes one pack of cigarettes per day. And he does not consume alcoholic beverages and does not use drugs. The partner takes the patient's vital signs. He has a heart rate of 74. It is regular and strong at the radial. He has a blood pressure of 192 over 98, taken by the NIBP, and confirmed with a manual cuff. Respirations are 18 and non labored. There's no pain with deep inspiration. His pulse oximeter is 96% on room air, and he has a temperature of 98.2 degrees Fahrenheit orally. His entitled carbon dioxide rating is 38 millimeters of mercury. You acquired this 12 lead EKG while the patient was seated in his recliner. Now that you have reviewed the subjective data and objective data, including a set of vital signs and Acquisition and interpretation of a 12 lead EKG. Have any of your differential diagnoses changed? This is not to say he cannot have a combination of any of the conditions listed below, and it is not an exhaustive list. But which condition is most likely, based upon the evidence in front of you? We can rule out some until we get to the point where we realize this patient has a STEMI and it is evident on the 12 lead EKG, regardless of what the backstory is or what his vital signs are. Let's jump into our anatomy, physiology, and pathophysiology review. So how big is the human heart? Well, the human heart is approximately the size of the patient's hand. So it varies from patient to patient and in different age groups. It is important for providers to understand the location of the heart. The human heart occupies the pericardial cavity, peri meaning around, around the cardiac, around the heart. The dorsal or posterior or back surface of the heart lies near the bodies of the vertebrae, the spine. The anterior, ventral or front, surface sits deep to the sternum and costal cartilages of the sternum. The great veins, the superior and inferior vena cava, and the great arteries, the aorta and pulmonary trunk, are attached to the superior surface of the heart called the base. In the human form, the base of an organ is the flattened or rounded part, where the apex is the pointed part. So the apex of the heart points towards the axillary line and the inferior portion of the body, where the apex of the lungs are up by the clavicles and point towards the superior portion of the body. The base of the heart is located at the level of the third costal 
cartilage. The inferior tip of the heart, the apex, lies just to the left of the sternum between the junction of the fourth and fifth ribs near their articulation with the coastal cartilages. This location will reveal itself as quite important when implying the pericardial leads later in this presentation. The right side of the heart is deflected anteriorly and the left side of the heart is deflected posteriorly. The apex is deviated to the left and is reflected in a depression in the medial surface of the inferior lobe of the left lung called the cardiac notch. As you may recall, your right lung has three lobes and your left lung has two, accommodating the space filled by the heart. Let's talk about how the blood flows through the heart. Deoxygenated blood comes in via the superior and inferior vena cava into the right atrium. It is then dumped into the right ventricle and sent to the lungs via the pulmonary artery. It goes through pulmonary circulation and hopefully returns oxygenated via the pulmonary veins into the left atria, is dumped into the left ventricle, and all that oxygenated blood is sent to the body via the aorta. Cardiomyopathy is a form of structural cardiac compromise that affects cardiac output significantly. In dilated cardiomyopathy, you have a dilated left ventricle and a very narrow, weak left ventricular wall. In hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you end up with a smaller left ventricle and a larger, inefficient, stiff, thick ventricular wall. It's not uncommon to know somebody who claims they either suffer from or know somebody who has perished from broken heart syndrome. There is a type of cardiomyopathy called Takasubo cardiomyopathy, which was discovered in 1991 by Japanese scientist Sato. It presents like acute coronary syndrome, but it's non-ischemic in nature, and it's caused by physical and emotional stress. It gets its name because the left ventricle becomes enlarged to the point where it takes on the shape of a Japanese octopus trap called the Takosuba. This affects cardiac output. The heart is a muscle, and as such, muscles of the human body need oxygen to survive. The heart is full of blood in the chambers, but requires its own blood supply. It gets its blood supply from the coronary arteries, which start at the aortic arch. During ventricular systole, blood is forced from the left ventricle through the aortic valve into the aorta to the body. Many people feel that the cardiac coronary arteries are supplied with blood at that time. However, the pressure is too high and it is during ventricular diastole when the aortic valve closes that the blood returns in through the aorta and passively fills the coronary arteries that the heart is supplied with blood. The right coronary artery supplies blood to the right atrium, right ventricle, bottom portion of the left ventricle, and back of the septum. The left coronary artery divides into two branches, the circumflex artery and the left anterior descending artery. The circumflex artery supplies blood to the left atrium and the side and back of the left ventricle. The left anterior descending artery, or LAD, supplies blood to the front and bottom of the left ventricle and the front of the septum. The coronary veins take oxygen poured or deoxygenated blood that has already been used by the muscles of the heart and returns it to the right atrium. How hard is it to block one of the coronary arteries? Well, when we look at the diameter of the coronary arteries, we can tell that it doesn't take a whole lot. The images below show a pencil, crayon, and eraser of a pencil between one millimeter and five millimeters. That is the average diameter of most of the coronary arteries. And you can see the PDA is 
1.39 to 1.45 millimeters, whereas the LMCA, one of the larger coronary arteries, is 4.13 to 4.43 millimeters. As you can see, the healthy artery has no obstruction and is delivering red blood cells packed with oxygen to the distal tissues. As time goes on, because of genetics or other non-modifiable risk factors or modifiable risk factors, such as a poor diet that is high in LDLs or cholesterol or non-compliance with the prescription regimen placed upon them by their provider, plaque begins to build up and deposit on the sides of the coronary arteries especially. These become calcified and it narrows the area in which blood can flow, restricting blood flow to the distal tissues. So if you look at the artery in the middle and it's starting to become obstructed, but it's not completely obstructed yet, imagine how that person feels when they start to perform exercise or they are mowing the lawn or walking up a set of stairs. They may not notice any pain until there is exertion, and the pain may subside after the exertion. On the right, you will see two pictures, and one is a RCA that has been completely occluded, and that will show up on your 12 lead EKG as a STEMI. It's a complete occlusion. There is no blood supply to the distal tissues, and you can see and appreciate after the stent, the amount of vasculature that has been opened up so blood supply can continue on. The heart remains the only organ in the human body which is able to generate its own electrical impulse. The impulse hopefully will start at the sinoatrial node located at the upper right corner of the right atria. The signal will travel through internodal pathways and will find itself at the atrioventricular node, what we know as the AV node. It slows down a little bit as it goes through the bundle of his. It branches off into the left and right bundle branch and ends up at the Purkinje fibers in the ventricles of the heart. Very simply put, there are two functions that occur to make the heart work. There are electrical functions, which is done through nodes and internal pathways, and a mechanical function, which is the filling and the emptying of the heart as a muscle. It is important for providers to understand that a person may have a perfectly normal looking EKG and not have a pulse at all. The presence of organized electrical function is not equal to the presence of organized mechanical function. We can't get through a anatomy and physiology and pathophysiology talk about the heart without talking about the action potential of cardiac muscles and the importance of sodium, potassium, and calcium. This will come full circle later on in this presentation. So although you don't need to memorize every phase and every action, it is important that you have an understanding that there is an influx and efflux of sodium, potassium, and calcium that drives this action potential. Thus, changes in the EKG will appear based upon these action potentials. The four phases created by the influx and efflux of sodium, potassium, and calcium rest between negative 90 and positive 30 millivolts at any given time during the cardiac cycle. The question of the QRS begins at phase zero and comes to an end at the end of phase two. The end of phase two, beginning of three, is where the T wave would be represented. And if you notice, there are letters in between phase two and between phase three, the ARP and the RRP. And what that stands for is the absolute refractory period and relative refractory period. During the absolute refractory period, there is no other stimulus that could cause a change. Whereas during the relative refractory period, if a change is caused, that could cause the rhythm to change 
into a rhythm such as ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia. You may have heard of R on T syndrome, and this is where it takes place. If you have trouble remembering this or grasping this concept, consider if you were to punch a punching bag, when you bring your arm back, that is very similar to repolarization. Depolarization would be when you punch the bag. At the point where you actually strike the bag, that would be your absolute refractory period. You punch it, your hand makes contact with the bag, and there's no other impulse that could cause anything greater than that. Unless, of course, you are Chuck Norris. In phase four, sodium and calcium channels close. Potassium rectified channels keep the TMP stable at negative 90 millivolts. Phase zero includes rapid sodium influx through open fast sodium channels. Transient potassium channels open and potassium efflux returns TMP to zero millivolts in phase one. In phase two, there is an influx of calcium through L-type calcium channels. It is electrically balanced by potassium efflux through delayed rectifier potassium channels. Phase three includes sodium and calcium channels closing. The delayed rectifier potassium channels open. This returns the TMP to negative 90 millivolts. There are two types of myocardial infarctions that are recognized. Type one MIs are acute MIs associated with plaque rupture or erosion. These are our STEMIs, or ST elevation myocardial infarcts, or non-STEMIs, non-ST elevation myocardial infarcts. Myocardial infarction secondary to ischemia due to other causes which increase oxygen demand or decrease supply are considered type two MIs. These can be caused by coronary artery spasm, coronary embolism, anemia, arrhythmias, hypertension, or hypotension. There are some MI mimics, and just to name a couple, spontaneous coronary artery dissection, which is very serious, and Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, which has been recognized as what is called broken heart syndrome. EMS providers at all levels should always ask why. This next segment will speak to the question, what causes the ST segment to become depressed? Why does that happen? Normal depolarization occurs from the subendocardial tissue and works its way outward. Depolarized ischemic subendocardial tissue generates electrical currents that are recorded by an overlying electrode. This could be leads V1 through V6. Notice that the ischemic section in this diagram is not all the way through the ventricular region, as would be the case in a STEMI. If the depolarizing currents are traveling toward a positive recording electrode, the baseline voltage prior to the QRS complex, which is normally isoelectric at zero millivolts, will be elevated. This is delineated with the red line above zero prior to the R wave in the resting figure. Once the ventricles become fully depolarized, the voltage reaches zero. As delineated by the red line we know as the ST segment. The ischemic portion of the ventricular wall sits as a depolarized section. Once the rest of the ventricles are depolarized, the voltage is recorded by zero by the electrode. It is recognized on the EKG as the ST segment is at zero millivolts. The net effect of the elevated baseline voltage is that the ST segment appears to be depressed as the PR and the TP sit elevated. So again, it's important to understand that in ST depression, you are dealing with a small portion or a non-transdermal portion of the 
ventricular wall. It doesn't go all the way through the ventricular wall. So as you look at the EKG, the net effect of the elevated baseline voltage is that the ST segment sits at zero, zero millivolts when the entire ventricular region is depolarized. Because the ST segment sits on zero and the PR segment and the TP segment sits higher than that, as you look at the EKG, it appears that the ST segment is depressed. We have taken a moment to reflect upon what causes the ST segment to become depressed. Now let's look at what causes the ST segment to become elevated, as in a STEMI. There are a couple of concepts that EMS providers need to understand when diagnosing a STEMI. Depolarization normally occurs from the subendocardial tissue and works its way outward. Ischemia or infarct is transmural in a STEMI. It works from the subendocardial tissue outward. We will start this explanation with the ventricle at rest or repolarized. The ischemic area sits in a depolarized state. The ventricles become depolarized as a whole. And once all of the muscle is depolarized, the voltage reaches zero. This voltage is recorded as zero by the electrode and recognized on the EKG as the ST segment. When the ventricle is completely repolarized, the baseline is once again negative, as in the resting state. The net effect of the depressed baseline voltage is that the ST segment appears to be elevated relative to the baseline. It is important to understand that 12 lead EKG interpretation requires a clear understanding of the vantage point each lead on the 12 lead EKG offers. That is done through a clear understanding of anatomy, physiology, and pathophysiology, as well as the electrical conduction of the heart. So you've arrived on scene and you've taken vital signs, you've obtained a medical history and objective data, such as vital signs and a 12 lead EKG, and your patient asks you, do you think I need to go to the hospital? And after you hopefully replied with a resounding yes, the patient may ask you why. Do you think I'm having a heart attack? This begs the question, can EMS tell if a patient with chest pain is having a heart attack? The answer is, there are only two ways a provider can definitively say if a patient is having a heart attack. The first way is through the acquisition and interpretation of a 12 lead EKG, and the second is through the acquisition and assessment of diagnostic testing, such as markers to include troponin or CKMB. The 12 lead EKG is performed at the patient's bedside, and in the event of a STEMI, then the provider can tell the patient within a high degree of certainty they are experiencing a, a major cardiac event, which requires further evaluation at the emergency department. And although some services do carry devices which will measure cardiac markers in blood work on scene, hospitals will be able to measure those markers and several others, including serial biomarkers, which may rise or lower depending on where the patient is in this cardiac event. These are some of the specific laboratory tests that are available primarily at the receiving facility that may not be available to EMS on scene. Proponent I stands to be one of the more frequently used laboratory tests at the emergency department to determine if a patient is experiencing a cardiac event. It starts to elevate within two to three hours of the cardiac event. It continues to rise until a peak is reached between 12 and 48 hours. And then the level will begin to fall to a normal level within four to 10 days. 
This will give the emergency department an idea of when the cardiac event started, at what point they are in their cardiac event, or if there is even a cardiac event occurring at all. Let's stop for a quick question and answer break. The human heart is about the size of a baseball, golf ball, football, the person's fist, or either A and D, depending upon the size of the person. If you have answered either A or D, depending upon the size of the person, you are correct. The coronary arteries originate at the aortic arch. They are filled with oxygenated blood entering the aorta during A, ventricular systole, B, ventricular depolarization, C, atrial diastole, or D, ventricular diastole. If you have answered ventricular diastole, you are correct. The blood backfills into the aorta against the closed aortic valve and passively enters the coronary arteries. You note the presence of a sinus rhythm at a rate of 80 in lead 2 on the cardiac monitor. Based upon this information, you realize which facts to be true. A. The patient has a strong pulse. B. The patient's cardiac rhythm is sinus rhythm or normal sinus rhythm. C, the patient is experiencing a myocardial infarction. D, the patient may or may not require immediate high quality CPR. E, both B and D are true statements. Or F, none of the above statements are true. If you have chosen E, both B and D are true statements, you are correct. The cardiac monitor, showing any rhythm except asystole, tells the provider the patient has electrical currents in the heart. It does not tell the provider that the patient has a pulse. A patient may have a sinus rhythm and no pulse. This is also known as PEA or pulseless electrical activity, which requires immediate high quality CPR. There are two ways that a provider can definitively determine if a patient is experiencing a heart attack. A, a blood pressure greater than 90 systolic and a pulse greater than 60. B, 12 lead EKG and the patient reporting they are pain-free after three nitroglycerin. C, a patient states, if I was having a heart attack, I wouldn't feel shoulder pain. And a 12 lead EKG. Or D, 12 lead EKG and laboratory testing which may include a troponin I. If you have selected D, a 12 lead EKG and laboratory testing, which may include a troponin I, you are correct. Cardiomyopathy is a structural defect in the heart, which may include which of the following? A, an enlarged left ventricle with a weak and thin ventricular wall. B, a narrowed left ventricle with an enlarged, stiff and inefficient left ventricle. C, a hole in the ventricular septum. D, both A and B are correct. Or E, none of the above are correct. If you answer D, both A and B are correct. You are correct. An enlarged left ventricle with a weak and thin ventricular wall or narrowed left ventricle with an enlarged, stiff, and efficient left ventricle are both types of cardiomyopathies. How many phases comprise the cardiac cycle? A, four, phases one through five, B, five, phases zero through four, C, 10, phases one through 10, D, two, phases one to two.
if you answered B, five phases, zero to four, you are correct. You have reached a conclusion of part one. For some of you, this was a review, and for others, perhaps you've learned something new. Proceed to part two to learn more.